shell chapter one and then start chapter two on conversion. So last class we were looking at the plot flow reactor. Let's just quickly recap what that is so that we are uh, all together here. The plot flow reactor is essentially a long tube. And over that tube we've got material entering. <coughs> so here's my concentration on the NCA. And as it's, it's entering the reactor, it starts to change its form. Okay. The very definition of the reaction is that the moment the species starts to change its form, we, we have a reaction occurring, and CA is going to be more At the exit, we have a certain concentration needed CA. Everywhere along this reactor, the concentration is something different. So the material enters at CA0 and it starts to react, changing the concentration, increasing, decreasing, all the way up to a final point, CA. The longer we make that reactor, the longer this material has to move, and we call this the specific way the material moves is in plug flow. So here's a plug of a certain width. So a very narrow, narrow plug. Essentially, I've just drawn it a little bit bigger here. But this plug moves down the reactor, and it's reacting. CA in here is, is changing the product as it moves further and down. More and more CA is reacting until I reach a final point. The longer I make this reactor, the longer that time that that plug has to spend in there and can be converted to a greater extent. So. This um, plug here is a very small width, delta V, and we derived the balance for it in the last class. So I won't go through that again. However, let's just uh, make some uh, notes here that are very important to understand. Let me, let me stress by, uh, well, let me start by saying my first note is that things are changing in the axial direction. In the axial direction, So, in other words, that's this direction here. In the axial direction, there are many properties are changing in that axial direction. The concentration is changing, the temperature is changing, all these other intensive properties that may be uh, changed as a, as a result of temperature. So, there's an exothermic reaction, there's maybe heat being generated, and <coughs> That there will be a temperature profile along this reactor. As the temperature is changing, viscosity is changing, density is changing. Those are functions of temperature as well. So in that axial direction, we can say things are changing. Not everything, perhaps certain properties do remain constant, but for the most part, almost everything is changing. But let's just say things are changing. That's the first uh, major major point about the plug flow reactor. In the radial direction, but let's specify in the radial direction at a certain point along the reactor. What I mean by that is, let's pick an arbitrary point, so here where this plug is, and if we look at that moment, at that position, I should say, at that position in the reactor, if I look in the radial direction, everything is constant. So in the radial direction, at a specific point along the reactor, everything is constant. Okay, so that's a critical critical And our derivation in the class uh, last time, we said this plug here of width delta V is so narrow that we can essentially consider everything within that plug to be constant as well. Okay, so, and then within the limit that that plug essentially becomes infinitesimally small, infinitesimally narrow, that assumption holds because of the second statement. In the radial direction, at a certain point, everything is constant. So those are the two key behaviors of the plug flow reactor. Practically, the second condition is not always met. The first condition is met. The second condition is very hard to enforce. One way we can enforce it is by filling this plug flow reactor with packing. 
So we introduce material into the reactor to intentionally create turbulence, to break up the flow, and to prevent um, a radial direction, a radial close mass forming. So there are practical ways of achieving that. Okay, so let me pass last time. Um, I have it up here in the slides now electronically. We won't go through the derivation again. But essentially, you said uh, taking the limit as it plugs with 10 to 0, we can derive this important equation here. And I'll just apply it up again. So this equation is the rate of change of the molar flow of J in the volume relative to the volume dB is equal to the rate of formation of species J. So that was our, our uh, design equation. I can integrate this equation as well. This is in differential form up here. But in integral form, I can integrate. Let's take a look at that. If I take the dB up to the right-hand side, bring the Rj down to the left, I can separate that integral then and integrate volume. And I'm integrating between the reactor entry point and the reactor exit point. So this is another key understanding you must have of plug flow reactors. We define a coordinate system for the plug flow reactor. And the coordinate system says that at the entry of the reactor, I have V is equal to zero. As my reactor progresses, I get to the exit. And at the exit, my coordinate is that V is equal to capital V. Okay, so I can write V at 0.25V, V at 0.33V, V at 0.75V. All of those represent some fraction of the distance along the reactor. So our integral then is from the entrance of, to, of the reactor. And the corresponding other integral at the entrance, we have our flow rate of the reactant, J, at the entrance, so Fj0. At the exit of the reactor, our limit of integration is capital V. At the exit is the final molar flow of species J at the exit. So there's my integral form and my, my derivative form. So using those equations then, I had asked you at the end of the class to go and try these examples. Now, when I ask you to go home and try examples, this is a great opportunity for you to get extra practice. Because the examples I've asked you to go home and try out are exactly like the examples that will be in midterms in the final exam. So it's a good, a great way for you to get extra practice. If you are relying on past papers to pass 3K, you're going to fail miserably. My testing style is not like any other professors in the department. So you do not know what my testing style is. I highly recommend that when I ask you to do questions, you do them. So that you get practice for the way I ask questions for the tutorials, for the assignments, and for the final exam. Okay, so previous exams, useless to me, I never look at them from other professors. Um, I have my own particular way of, of making sure you understand the material. So let's take a look at these questions I've asked you to consider. The first part, straight from the textbook. So you can look that up again if you don't like my derivation. The parts two and three I've added intentionally to introduce some new concepts here. So let's take a look. We'd say, a is going to be in a tubular reactor, so it's the system that you're deriving. We have that our P is entering at a certain volumetric flow rate. Q is equal to 10 liters per minute. So my entry flow rate here, Q, 10 liters per minute, my rate of addition. One of the key assumptions with a plug flow reactor for the derivation is that at steady state, the entry flow rate is the same as the exit flow rate, especially for liquid reactions. So this exit volumetric flow rate is also Q at 10 liters per minute. There's a first order reaction taking place. So R, uh, the rate of consumption of A is equal to K times CA, would be one way of stating that. And the reaction rate constant then is given as K is 0.23 minutes to the minus one. So when we say first order kinetics, um, we will assume that it's with respect to the reagent A, and that's the rate constant given to the level. Key question for any design of a reactor, how big? So for plug flow reactors and for CSTR reactors, our question is always, how big? So here it is. How big should this reactor be so that we can get a conversion of 90%? In other words, an exiting concentration of 10% of the original coming in. So we start 
from our general mole balance. Our general mole balance, we won't go through it again, but we, in, in a test or an exam, you would start from the general mole balance and then make the assumptions. The assumptions are steady state, well mixed in the radial direction. Knowing those two assumptions, we can then say, we can write down dfj by db is equal to minus rj, or in this case, let's use a as our species, so dfa, we can use uh, j as a, db is equal to the important point here, plus ra. We don't have to derive that equation. You can, you can write down, say, from the general mole balance, assuming A, B, C, D assumptions, this is what I get. But you must state those assumptions. Liquid phase, constant volume, steady state. We've heard lots of assumptions over the past few classes. We have to be clear when they apply and to which system they apply. So knowing that, then we can go ahead and write down that expression. I won't go through all the derivation here on the board. It is in the notes now for you. So DFA DV is equal to plus RA, substituting RA. RA is equal to minus KCA. One important point, we would like to know the exit concentration. We were given information on, <coughs> sorry, we were given the starting equations in terms of molar flow. Molar flow concentration, don't quite match, so let's uh, let's get let's get them matching. Well, we look at the equation last class for molar flow relating it to concentration, and we had the the key equation is that F A. volumetric input, so that simplifies to Q dCA. So Q dCA, and this, excuse this, the error here, that should be dV in the denominator. So it's correct in the last line there, Q times dCA dV is equal to RA, which is equal to minus kCA. So left hand side I've got dCA, right hand side I've got a capital CA, Let's uh, simply, uh, rearrange that <coughs> and, and do our integral. So our integral then, dCA over C, we can pull out the Q and the K outside the integral. Those, those do not change along the reactor length. Okay, so coming back here. In the, in the axial direction, things are changing. But notice I did not write everything is changing. Certain properties are constant in the axial direction. The rate constant, K, does not change along the reactor. The rate constant, K, remains the same for this particular problem. If the rate constant, we call from chemistry, rate constant, K, is equal to K0, E to the minus E over RT. We saw that in the tutorial. So if the temperature is changing across the length of the reactor, rate constant, K, is changing across the reactor, and then I cannot take it out the integral. Okay, so for this particular example, we should have this additional assumption. Please write this to, into the notes. Assuming the rate constant K is constant throughout the reactor's axial direction. In the final course project that you do for this course, those assumptions will disappear. All these assumptions we're making now will be eliminated. You will have to assume temperature dependence. We will have to assume that the rate constant changes throughout the reactor. So we cannot make the simplification like this. Okay, so we're going to get to that point eventually by the fourth and fifth chapter of Vogler. For now though, K assumes to be constant, pull it out the integral. The, the flow, Q, constant throughout the length of the axial direction, pull it out the integral. Integrate and we get symbolically this equation. Now I would urge you the following. Resist the temptation to substitute values in early on. We, we like to do that and work with numbers, but I would strongly suggest that you work symbolically for as long as possible in all the reactor design problems. It's a very good strategy because if you work symbolically, you'll often find that things cancel out. 
Okay? If you don't work symbolically, you may often find that you've got um, symbols there that you don't have the values for. But if you work with them symbolically, they'll cancel out and you don't actually need the values for them later on. So that's a key, a key technique to learn for reactive design. Work symbolically for as long as possible, then we substitute it. Let's get, so we've gone into a lot of details. Let's step back. Our aim here, remember, was to determine the volume. How big? So my integral now on the right hand side has volume as a function of these symbols here on the left. Let me just flip it around for you. V is equal to, and substitute the values in that we have, and we get 100 liters. So now that I know the volume of my, my uh, tube, I can then go calculate, well, for a given diameter, I can go purchase a tube from a supplier with a certain diameter, and knowing that diameter, I can then back calculate the length of the tube I want to purchase. Okay, is this part one clear for Okay, so this is an example straight from the textbook. Please go through it as well if you uh, need it. So in, if you've got the 2006 edition, F2006, it's example 1.1. One, one. If you've got the, the newer version of the textbook, it's example 1.2. But let's take it a step further. I asked here in the, in the class last time, well, hang on, your boss is asking you to get a greater level of conversion. 90% isn't quite good enough. It means that when that final product coming out in your reactor still has unconverted A, if you're selling that as a product to your customer, they're going to consider that an impurity. They don't, they're not buying A from you, they're buying B from you. <coughs> so if this was a reaction A goes to B, the customer is interested in B. They're not interested in unreacted A. So if you've got a high amount of A at the end, you've got two options. You're going to have to put in a lot of energy and buy equipment like a distillation column or a membrane or some form of separation to separate A from B later on. So that's going to cost you money, it's going to cost you time. Or you can change conditions in your reactor so that you get a greater level of conversion here. So leave less of A at the exit. So this is another important question that comes up all the time. What do I need to do to get 99% conversion? So we're going from 90 to 99, a semi, seemingly small increase in conversion. Okay? But as you'll find with all things in engineering, the cost of incremental performance to get to a limit, the limit is obviously 100%, the cost as you approach the limit gets greater and greater. And here we find the same equation we had before, we don't really change anything other than subbing in here instead of subbing in point 0.1 as subbing in point zero 0.01 to get 99% conversion. I find that my reactor requirement doubles. That's huge. I've got to go double the length, double the capital cost to get a 9% improvement. Okay. What do I do? Do I go buy an extra piece of pipe and add it, weld it onto the end? Get my, I need a 200 liter reactor, so now do I go buy an extra piece of pipe, add it on, make this reactor double the length? How would you do this practically? Increase the flow. Okay, so there's one option, and that's where we're leading to next, which is why we had question three. Okay, so question three is, Let's take a look at, well, we could level the length of the reactor, that's one way. But another option we have is we could decrease the flow rate. So, sub in again here, Q, a different Q, instead of 10 liters per minute, we go and sub in 5 liters per minute, and we'll find that our outlet conversion, so, re so you simply take this equation and solve for CA, divided by C is zero. So let's actually, we go back to this equation, we sum in half the value of Q, same rate constant, same volume, still a 100 liter reactor. So for CA divided by C is zero, you'll find that that conversion is 99%. Okay, so you could have achieved the same goal without spending any money. You could have still achieved 99% conversion, but not buy anything new. Have you solved the problem? <laughs> 
So you've achieved the 99% conversion that your boss has asked you for. But you're going to take double the time to produce the, the product. So unless it's a slow season and you've got lots of time in your hand, or you've got a lot of cheap operators, a lot of cheap labor, you can add on a second shift, that's going to be a good solution. And in many cases, that's what companies will do. It may be cheaper to hire a second shift and pay for extra labor, extra managers, and extra engineers to supervise than to spend a couple of million dollars on purchasing another reactor. Okay, so it's good to know what these trade-offs are. Now we've gone from the engineering world to the economic world. But we've gone through it using our reactor design equations. We can now actually clearly tell our boss, here's two strategies. Either you spend X million dollars to double the size of the reactor, or you spend some other amount of money, part of the flow rate, but operate at double the shift. What if your company is already operating 24-7? Okay, now you're thinking along the lines I want you to think. Add catalysts, increase the temperature, change something else in this equation. So always, this equation holds no matter what, right? All conditions, this equation holds. So you have to go look at this equation. This is why I said earlier, work symbolically, because this is now really powerful. I can now go look at this equation and say, well, hang on, I need to get 99%. So that fixes those two variables. What are my other three variables? Q, K, and V. If my boss is not going to spend any money, I can't change V. Then I've only got two variables. I can go change Q, or I can go change K. So, so how can I change K? Look at catalysts, look at changing the temperature. Okay. So work symbolically. If you work, if you substitute it in earlier on, you won't be able to interpret and find that information out further down here. Okay, so this is an important problem. Right in week two of this reactor design course, we've been able to solve really crucial engineering problems using two, three equations derived with very little assumptions and knowledge. Okay? It's only going to get more exciting from here on. So let's take a look then at a quick summary. Was there any? Um, so let's take a look at what it is for if we're looking at catalysts. So that's an excellent suggestion. If we're looking at catalysts, we now have what's called a packed bed reactor. So a packed bed reactor is, I'm not going to go through the, the derivation point, but the idea is identical. Take your plug flow reactor, your empty tube, and you simply stuff it with catalyst. Okay, so you can be packed very really tight. Lots and lots of catalysts. And you spend two, three, five, six to ten million dollars on filling a catalyst Filling of those tubes with catalysts. Catalysts are not cheap. It's vanadium, it's platinum, rare earth metal. These are not, not cheap uh, materials. Yes. So if you go to like six years to get a catalyst, and you need to crack it to double the length of the Good question. That's exactly what you should look at. But now you've got your equations to, help, to back you up. We're now going to look at how much catalyst do you need. Okay, so this is the question we're trying to ask. So let's recap. Batch reactors, the main question is, how long do I run my reactor? CSTR, how big is my reactor? Plug flow reactor, how long is my reactor? Catalyst, PFR, packed bed reactor, how much catalyst do I need? How do you answer the question of how much catalyst? We go through the same derivation, but this time we express our rate constant slightly differently. So here, the rate constant for a packed bed reactor is moles of J divided by time. So this is the rate of formation of J per unit kilogram catalyst. Okay, so let's take a look at our regular rate constants that we've used to up to this point in the course is moles of J per unit time. So rate of formation of J per unit volume. For catalytic reactors, packed bed reactors, we just simply change and exchange the volume for per mass of catalyst. Because remember, for a plug flow reactor, our question is how big? What's the volume? For a catalytic reactor, how much catalyst? So change the volume for the catalyst. Okay. So that's my rate of my rate expression there 
for packed bed reacts, I simply look up or I do experiments and I calculate RJ dash. So RJ comes from experiments. RJ dash also comes from experiments. Yes? The only difference between the EFR and the TDR is the catalyst. This catalyst. And we re-express our rate equation in terms of massive catalyst rather than the involved. Because it's clear, if I've got more catalyst in there, I'm going to get more, more reaction. PFR, more volume, more reaction. So there's, a, there's an equivalency. This is why I don't go through the derivation for a packed bed reactor. The two concepts are identical. One is a tube, one is a tube with stuff inside. So here's a, a slide that shows them for you side by side. PFR's equation, we derived this and used it now to solve this previous example. PBR, packed bed reactor, same idea, flow in to the pack, into the packed bed, flow out of the packed bed, integrate, now I change. Here's, my, here's the key difference. The plug flow reactor, I, my coordinate system was volume. Volume at the entrance of the reactor to the exit. So my x-axis here over which I'm concerned is the volume dimension. PBR, my axis is the catalyst weight dimension, direction. Okay? So at the entrance to my packed bed, W, my weight of catalyst is zero. Right at the entrance to my reactor, there is no catalyst. As I go through the reactor, the gases or the liquids, whatever my species are, so PDRs are, are always gas or liquid, liquid phase systems. As I pass through my reactor, the reagents see more and more catalyst. So at the midpoint, W would be 0.5. At the exit, W is equal to W. So my coordinate system changes in the PBR, in the packed bed reactor. So my integral changes from the V to a W. My rate that I used, RJ, okay. error, in the, error in the notes, please fix this up. RJ without the dash. Okay, this is me copying and pasting. RJ, no dash on the left hand side. Can you fix that up? On the right hand side for the pack bed reactor, my base expression is RJ dash per unit weight. The integral that I get from it, sorry, the differential equation I get from that, DFJ by the E is RJ, DFJ by the W is equal to RJ dash. Okay, so for the most part, you'll pack this catalyst evenly or uniformly. So it would be proportional to the length as well. Okay, do you understand for, good, okay, so this is a good question. Uh, the question is why is W0 at the reactor entrance? Let's take a look at that because these two systems are identical. We can, whatever we learn on this system applies to that system there. So we learned here at the PFR, my coordinate system is V. V at the reactor entrance is zero because at this point, I've got a zero volume reactor. Right at the entrance, my, my reactant A is coming in. Before it even enters the reactor, it's got no volume to react in. Okay, simply coming in at, at my entry point, there is no volume. The moment this material starts to move through the reactor, it's seeing more and more volume. At the midpoint, it's got half the volume of the reactor available to it. At the end point, it's got B equal to capital B. Same idea for catalyst. At the entrance, there is no catalyst for the reagents to go to. So A cannot go onto the catalytic site and, and start to react and form an EMC. So the W is zero, my coordinate system is zero at the entrance. Now what? Kind of 0 0.5 or 0 0.5? It's W is equal to 0 0.5. So W, this is, a, this is a confusing thing. W, capital W is the total weight of catalyst. 
Yeah, so I guess I should like to do a point of Yeah, thank you. I see how many you're going. Okay, so at the midpoint, I've got half the total capital value of it. Okay, let's, let's have a quick summary of this chapter one. The summary is as follows. We started four classes ago with this equation. Mole of <coughs> key thing about this chapter, forget mass balances. I don't want to see any mass balances in this course. No mass balances required to solve these problems. We work in moles. Molar flow quickly in time. Molar flow in minus molar flow out plus molar flow generated. No consumed term. Consumed term is not, not here because we're considering net generation. So this integral net generation of species J. Those three terms combined mean the rate of accumulation. This term dnj by dt is how fast or slow this material is accumulated in the system. This equation applies to every single reactor type under every possible condition, liquid, gas, solid. All things can vary at all times. This is the most general form of the equation. This is your starting point for every single problem. We looked at, yes? Yeah. No? Okay, so print these out and bring them to class. If you're writing them down, you're making mistakes, I can guarantee it. Even I would have mistakes in my slides. Okay, so let's not, uh, let's not uh, make, make, make sure that we're... Let's take a look at that equation and apply it to our four reactors, to summarize. Batch reactor, I make the assumption that my batch system is well mixed internally. So that the reactor is constantly mixed, but it is not in steady state. You can never make these steady state assumptions for a batch reactor. To say a batch reactor operates in steady state is to indicate that you don't understand what a batch reactor is. A batch reactor never operates in steady state. By definition, a batch is never at steady state. It's always changing. I guess the only time a batch is ever at steady state is when it reaches equilibrium, which means you've left it there for a long, long time. But in general, batches will never reach steady state. So that dnj by dt term from the general balance never disappears. Okay, so back to my general balance, this term over here never goes away for a batch reactor. For a CSTR, making the assumption of steady state and well mixed, we get a very nice equation. We like CSTRs. There's no integrals, no derivatives. It's a nice algebraic equation that's easy to work with. That equation over there tells me how big my reactor needs to be if I'm feeding material at a certain flow rate, a molar flow rate, not a mass flow rate, withdrawing it at a certain flow rate at J, and I know my rate. Consumption of J. So, continuous stir tank reactors, the question is how big? That equation answers that. On the flow reactors, the key question again how big? We can derive this equation dfj by dv is equal to rj. That's what we have up here on the board. That's where we started off this evening from. We can integrate that and answer the question how big. Capital V is equal to the integral, and it's the integral from the entry conditions to the exit conditions, fj, f. So from, I integrate from the beginning of my reactor to the end of my reactor. Sometimes we won't know the molar flow rate, Fj, so we need to sub in the concentration terms. Concentration and volumetric flow are easy to measure. So come back to here. We discussed in the class last time. Fa, not easy to measure. I cannot buy a molar flow sensor. I can easily buy a sensor that measures volumetric flow, Q, easily calculate Ca uh, and measure it from a laboratory. So we like to work in CA and Q if we are possible and not with FA. When we made the concentration, 
that one because we use salary for the time. Another general assumption law, if temperature is changing inside your plug flow reactor from entry to exit, and it will for most equations that we start to look at from the third and fourth chapter on, uh, sorry, from the third and fifth chapter on the you need to take the temperature dependence in across the length of the reactor. So for now, we're working with really simple systems that are isothermal. We're making the isothermal assumption for now. If you integrate that and you instead of you don't have flow rate and use concentration, once you get the CSTR formula. So you're subbing in the C A for yeah. FJ? Yeah. And you've got Q. Yeah, if you're going from C A not to C A and Q is equal Q A equals to Q out. If you're assuming that, yeah, you're gonna have the same formula as yeah, the exact same. Minus R J. Yeah. Have you got it on paper? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, look, let's take a look. Good question. Let's, let's see. So the question is, is our PFR equation, I don't know the answer to it, so let's take a look. Let's work with it. The interesting question here is whether this integral equation here for PFR isn't this just the CSTR, CSTR equation. So under conditions of concentration. So if I put in concentration there, dfj is equal to dca times q. Okay. So if I integrate that between the volume is equal to fj0, the entrance, uh, so again fj0 would be ca0, exit would be ca, dfj is equal to dca, <coughs> times Q, Q I can bring outside the integral, constant flow, divided by plus RJ. So that's going to equal, let's assume our, I, I now see where this is going. You can't assume RJ is constant and take it up the integral. Okay. And this is a good, this is actually an excellent, excellent point that I didn't mention and I have it in my previous slide and I skipped over the point. Okay, so here's where I start. I've got Q, CA goes to CA0 to CA, BCA over my plus RJ. The temptation might be to take RJ out the integral and then that would look like the CSGR formula which is where you're going. Can I do that? What is my, my bottom integral? What's this called again? Integrand? I forget these terms. The lower limit. Okay, that's easier to work with. So the lower limit corresponds to my reactor entrance. The upper limit corresponds to my reactor exit. Is Rj constant throughout the axial direction? In general, no. There's only one case that it is for a zero order reaction. But in general, Rj is KCA, and CA is changing through the duration of the reactor. Here's the point I had in my previous, oh, I don't have it. That's in mind. It's probably in another slide. Oh, it's in the next section, that's why. CSTR, Rj, is Rj constant? Inside the tank, provided it's well mixed, it is constant, K times CA, if it's a first order. <coughs> And so, so if it's constant, this is the RJ, um, and you give RJ equal to some sort of K times CA value? Yeah. Yeah. So what's, what's CA? Is that the exit? Is that the concentration at the beginning or in the end? Or, I don't know. That's in the tank? Yeah, good question. Let's take a look at that. So CSTR, material coming in at CA0, well mixed in pellet. Concentration leaving, CA. This minus RJ term, let's assume it's first order kinetics. So I'm changing J to refer to, refer to A. Minus RA for first order kinetics is KCA. Which CA do I use in that expression for RA minus RA? The entrance, the exit, or some other value in between? The average, maybe? 
Think about it for a minute. Which concentration goes into this rate expression? This rate expression down here, what do I sub in? Right. So the concentration in the tank is the same as the concentration at the exit for the well mixed assumption. So again, coming back to all these assumptions, well mixed, this concentration leaving is the same as the concentration in the tank. It's the concentration up here, it's the concentration up here. Right where this material flows in, even that is concentration C A. Okay, that's the assumption, the very overly simplified assumption for CSTR. So minus R J, <coughs> this rate of consumption of species J, you sub in your rate expression and it corresponds to the exit conditions from the tank. Plug flow reactor is probably the most, I don't want to use the word hard reactor, but it's, the, it's a reactor where things are changing along the axial direction. So you can't assume anything is really constant unless you're absolutely sure. CSTR, we don't have an integral, we don't have a derivative because of this very, very big steady state well mixed. Those two assumptions are very key. They're very powerful assumptions. They lead to a very simple form of expression. But there are limitations. They may not always hold. Okay, so some good discussion then. Everyone comfortable with, uh, with where we are here? Okay. If you're not, I strongly recommend you go through the video again from tonight's class and the previous class because this is this is important. This is the base of the, the course. Okay. I don't have the slide in the um, in the notes, but in Fogler's uh, textbook, by the way, if you if you uh, put in the DVD that comes with the textbook. Uh, there's all the PowerPoints for Fogler's class are there. So if you don't like my PowerPoints, you, that's not the only resource you have available. Please use that. There's PowerPoints inside the course textbook. One of the nice slides that he has is that he draws this picture of mole balances go here at the bottom. Okay. This is the base that we're going to build on. We're going to have, by the end of this course, four or five layers. If you don't get this foundation right now, you're not going to do well for the remainder of this course. So the slide that he has is, if I take that cube and I make that a cylinder, you've got the cylinder on which you're building future areas. So even if you understand the next section of conversion well, you've built on a foundation that's a cylinder, it's wobbly. Right? There's a risk that you don't understand what's, what we've covered in these past five classes. Make sure that this foundation is not a cylinder, but a solid, solid base, because these concepts are going to propagate through the rest of the, the, the next process. OK, so that's the end of that slide, of this chapter. So let's take a look now at chapter two. I've got a few minutes that I'll just introduce the topic and we can see how far we get. So chapter two, Fogler is chapter two. We're now moving away from concentrations and molar flows and we're going to head towards this idea of using conversions. So right now, we look at using CA0, CA at the exit. We look at FA0, FA at the exit. Molar flows, concentrations. We don't like to work with those. We like to work with conversions. Conversions, for some reason, I don't understand. People like to work with percentages. Percentage for your, um, for your, when you buy a house and you have to get a mortgage, the interest rate at the bank. Percentages, percentages, we see percentages all around us. We like to work with them. They can be confusing. Fortunately for reactor design, the percentage we're choosing to use at conversion is really easy. Very easy to specify, very easy to work with. So we follow the following convention. I'll come back to that equation then. Simply the conversion, Popol, remember, definition. Popol here says that extended reaction is the conversion. So how far along the reaction are we? Let's define conversion as follows. <coughs> I put a certain amount of material into my reactor, 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 CSTR, plug flow reactor. That material is going to react and change its state. 
So conversion then is the number of moles that did change, number of moles consumed, number of moles reacted, whatever you prefer to call it, divided by what I started off with. So what I get out, divided by what I get put in. Leaving, the exit, divided by what I put in, the entrance. It's a CSTR, what I put in, divided by what I take out, the end. If it's a batch reactor, I fill my batch up with new material, with new raw materials, turn on the batch, wait a few hours, minutes, days, empty the batch, I'm going to get a certain amount of reactor. So what I, what I use up divided by what I start with. That's conversion. Very, very easy. We'll call that capital X. Okay. So what do we do that uh, use conversion? Well, in a, in a system where we've got multiple species, we could look at the conversion of any number of them. So here I've got a system with A, B, C, and D. I can specify conversion in terms of A and I can specify conversion in terms of B. Okay? Because it's generally, we're going to take it from terms of the, the left hand side because that's our interesting material that we want to consume and use up. And we can pick either conversion with respect to A or conversion with respect to B. Our general preference is to pick the species which is going to be used up first. So I'm going to add A and I'm going to add excess B. A is going to be used on a one-to-one -one molar ratio with B. Because B is in excess, A is going to be used up first. My preference then is to specify conversion in terms of A, so X sub A. We will drop the A. In general, it will be clear which species the conversion refers to. So we will just call it capital X. So let's uh, take a look at, at conversion quickly for a batch system. For a batch system, remember, our key design criteria is how long. All the other systems is how big, how much catalyst. But for a batch, it's unique. A batch is special. A batch, remember, is never at steady state. It's always changing the time. And as a result, our question for batches are always how long. For an irreversible reaction, if we leave it there for an infinite time, we're going to get a 100% conversion. If we have a, a reversible reaction, so we've got some equilibrium I, uh, concepts we need to take into account, my conversion will tend to be my equilibrium conversion, whatever that might be, as time tends to invent. For these other reactors, CSTRs, PFRs, PBRs, conversion is going to be a function of the volume. As this material goes through the reactor, it's going to convert, 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 and leave with some final conversion. As you can imagine, for a PFR, right at the entrance here, conversion is zero. And it's going to increase to some final conversion at the exit. It's going to increase. It starts at zero, it's going to go up to some final conversion at the exit. Okay, so what we'll look at in the next class, if you want to read ahead, these are the chapters from Folger, 2.2, 2.3. We'll cover the expressions in terms of conversion.